included among those Jews who became believers in the Lord Jesus, was a strong group of priests and another group of Pharisees, people who had studied the word of God and were proud of their knowledge of God and were proud of their religion. And while they acknowledged Jesus Christ as Lord, they could only see Jesus as being the King of the Jews. Therefore Gentiles who believed in him would have to become Jews to be Christians, to be followers of Jesus, because Jesus was King of the Jews, to be part of his kingdom. And so they insisted it was necessary that the Gentile Christians be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. But this idea was not held by the vast majority of Jewish background believers, as we see in the beginning of Acts chapter 15, where these people we call Judaizers had argued vehemently in the church at Antioch and surrounding that the Gentile believers had to become proper Jews. Since they would not accept the ruling of Paul and Barnabas and the other believers, since these Judaizers claimed authority from James, the brother of the Lord Jesus. Since Jesus was the king, but Jesus was not there, in their mind, James was vice-regent, acting in the role of the king. So the church in Antioch sent Paul and Barnabas up to Jerusalem to discuss the matter with James and Peter. Was indeed there a division between the apostles, James and Peter and Barnabas and Paul? So, being sent on their way by the church, Paul and Barnabas passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, who believed, rose up, saying, It's necessary to circumcise them, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And so the apostles and elders came together to consider the matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. My name's Arthur, and I thank you for joining me as we join the debate in the early church about whether Christians are bound to keep the law of Moses and must be circumcised and regarded as Jews to be saved. The chapter goes on to to present details of what Barnabas and Paul shared and then a message from James, the brother of the Lord Jesus and the agreement that it was not necessary for Gentile believers to be circumcised and concerning the law, they were not bound to keep all the law of Moses. Indeed, many of the requirements of the law of Moses depended on the children of Israel living in the land. And Jesus had indicated that the Jews themselves would be expelled from the land. So it would not even be possible for Jews to keep those commandments during the times of the Gentiles. The letter that this council wrote to the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria and Cilicia put a much lower standard on what was required of them in an absolute sense. There was to be a recognition of their Jewish brethren, but they were not bound to keep the whole Jewish law. But we begin by the words that Peter declared. Peter had been up to Antioch, we find in the epistle to the Galatians, and when these Judaizers turned up and started arguing that the Gentiles had to become Jews, Peter was influenced by them 
and withdrew fellowship from some of the Gentile believers because the Jewish people had maintained strong separation from Gentiles through many centuries. It's only in this way that they have been preserved as a people throughout the millennia. And so Peter had withdrawn fellowship from the Gentile believers until Paul remonstrated and publicly confronted him about the matter, saying that not even the Jews had been able to keep the law, so it was futile trying to get the Gentiles to live by that law. Now we find Peter going back to Tours, back to the basics, and saying, well, you know, a long time ago, at least ten years earlier, that Peter was the first one to formally bring Gentile believers into the church, having previously brought Samaritan believers into the church. The Lord had specifically directed him to go to a Gentile house, saying, as reported in Acts chapter 10, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. And when Peter had said that, the Holy Spirit fell on them. And the Jews that were with Paul were astonished. These Gentiles were believers in God, but they didn't know their sins would be forgiven if they believed in Jesus. And so when they heard that message, they believed and were saved. God gave them the Holy Spirit. And in Gentile languages, they spoke praising God in a most remarkable way that reminded Peter of the day when the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles. And they spoke in Gentile languages. So the fact that God was being worshipped in Gentile languages was a key part of his argument. God knows the hearts of people and he knew the righteousness of Cornelius and his household his family, his servants. He acknowledged that by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He didn't require that they be circumcised first or even afterwards. He didn't put any other obligations upon them in terms of having to keep the law of Moses or change their culture or their character. It was the Holy Spirit who purified their hearts by faith. But now they are being challenged to test God, to put God to the test by putting a yoke on these disciples, which, as Paul had told Peter, Peter now repeats to the council, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved in the same manner as they. That is, the gospel is that it is Jesus who saves. We don't save ourselves by our religious works. We can't add anything to the salvation that we have obtained. But when we are saved through faith, the Lord Jesus through his Spirit will purify our hearts. This is the experience of Jewish believers and of Gentile believers. So Peter is definitely not arguing that the Gentile believers must be circumcised and keep all the law of Moses.